Um, let's see. Well, I'm gonna, so, hi everybody in this room. I'm going to talk to this camera. All right. So, um, hello everybody. Welcome to Western Illinois University Biological Sciences um, Department Seminar Series. I'm Sean Meager, a professor in this department. Um, our speaker today is Dr. Douglas Tallamy. Uh, before I introduce him, I want to say a couple administrative things. So, first, funding for this talk is provided by the Roger and Jean Morrow Distinguished Lecture Fund. Uh, in two weeks, we're going to have another speaker talking about vector-borne disease, uh, Dr. Brian Allen from the University of Illinois. So we'll tell you more about that. Uh, if you're listening in from outside, please mute. Okay. Uh, and now I'll talk about the speaker. Today, we'll have Dr. Doug Tallamy speak to us. He got his bachelor's degree at Allegheny College, his master's degree at Rutgers University, his PhD at the University of Maryland, and was a postdoc at the University of Iowa. I was reading his CV, and he was there the year I started college in Iowa, but I have not met him before. Um, both his, all of his master's, PhD, and postdoc were all in entomology. Uh, Dr. Tallamy currently works at the University of Delaware, he, where he is the T.A. Baker Professor of Agriculture and Natural Resources in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology. He also has a joint appointment in the Department of Biological Sciences. Dr. Tallamy is a national <laughs> expert on insect-plant interactions, especially the benefits of gardening with native plants for the benefit of biological diversity. He has written over 100 articles on this and several popular books, and I just want to show you that I'm kind of a groupie. These are my copies of Dr. Tallamy's books that I'm happy to show you after the talk. Okay. Um, Dr. Tallamy, in addition to all of his publications, is co-founder of an organization called Homegrown National Park, which encourages native plant gardening. Uh, Dr. Tallamy's talk today is titled, Are Alien Plants Bad? And now I hand it over to the AV people. Okay. <laughs> Doug, you can start. All right, great. Yeah, are alien plants bad? You know, this actually has been a controversial subject for, for a while. Um, we've got plants from other continents, and people wonder, really, should we be spending any resources on trying to get rid of them? So that's what this talk is about. Uh, but I have to say, I get pushback on that title because the word alien conjures up um, negative things. Uh, so people think that I'm biasing the argument by using the term alien. They've suggested maybe exotic, uh, but that conjures up things that are strangely beautiful, enticing, fascinating. Uh, and that's really not what I'm thinking about either. So out-of-towners has been suggested. I kind of like that. But introduced, these are plants that have been introduced either accidentally, many of them on purpose. So let's stick with introduced. So now we've got our introduced plants bad. But I've also been challenged on using the word bad. Um, that's judgmental. And I'm going to push back on that because good and bad are actually relative terms, and they can be measured without subjectivity. So, for example, if we ask the question, is Doug Tallamy good or bad at basketball? Um, well, if I'm comparing my skills to my two-year-old granddaughter, I'm pretty good. But if I go up against LeBron James, not so good anymore. So it's all relative. You have to specify your terms. So I'm going to stick with this title, Are Introduced Plants Bad? Uh, all right. Well, you know, nature is comprised largely of very specialized interactions, mostly between animals and plants, such as the interaction between jays and, and oaks. Jays are the primary disperser of oak acorns. They'll take an acorn, fly up to a mile, mile and a half from the parent tree. They tap it below the soil, of the surface of the soil, and the object is they're going to go back in the wintertime and have something to eat. But for every four acorns they bury, they only remember where one is. So for every four acorns they bury, they've actually planted three oak trees. The specialized interaction between uh, uh, acorn woodpeckers and acorns. If you don't have any acorns, you won't have any, uh, not woodpeckers, that's a weevil, acorn weevils. You won't have any acorn weevils. You won't have this bee, Andrena faciliae, unless you have facilia, that is the only plant, the only pollen that that bee can reproduce on. And it turns out that pollen specialization is very common in our native bees. We've got between 3,600 and 4,000 species of native bees, and over a third of them can only reproduce in the pollen of particular plants. So in California, for example, there's 63 species of bees that require sunflowers. Very specialized interaction. So specialization in the natural world, particularly food specialization, is the rule rather than the exception, and it always starts with plants. 
Today, though, these specialized relationships uh, are threatened uh, because of what we call novel ecosystems. Uh, we are moving plants and animals around the world, creating um, in assemblages of organisms that have never interacted over evolutionary time before. Um, so organisms in novel ecosystems are just meeting each other for the first time. They have not had the time to develop any of the specialized relationships that I just described. So the question is, does that matter? Uh, well, this is what the controversy is about. Um, everyone's smiling. This was 2016, but um, yeah, major major uh, news outlets covering invasive species and wondering, should we be worried about them at all? Well, we don't have to argue about it. We can measure it. We can measure whether introduced species are good or bad, and we can specify the terms here. So that's what we're going to do in this talk. We've got to ask uh, whether there's a net positive or a net negative effect on ecosystems from introduced organisms. Uh, we can't just say, well, look, they do this one positive thing unless you measure the negative things as well. So it's, it's net effect that we're interested in. Now, some claim that plant invasions are not bad for a number of reasons. There's no global extinctions recorded from mainland invasions. Post-invasion species richness is higher. And we're going to talk about each one of these. Birds don't care if a berry is native or non-native. Invasive communities are different, but not inappropriate. Introduced plants are here to stay, so we should embrace them. Invasion is just another word for change. We're going to talk about each one of these statements because these are all in the literature and they've caused quite a stir. It's also been claimed that, that we don't like introduced plants because of nativism. We just don't like things that aren't native. Our response to introduced plants is, is based as much on aesthetics, morality, and politics as it is on science, and introduced species can provide important benefits to ecosystems. And then finally, returning ecosystems to some mythical pristine state is a fool's errand, and shouldn't there be a statue of limitations on being alien? All right. Well, Mark Davis, who's written a lot about plant invasion, says you shouldn't judge a plant by its origins. You should judge it based on its function. And I agree with that completely. Uh, so if, for example, uh, this is autumn olive, if it uh, was the ecological equivalent of the native plant species that it's displacing, then there should be no impact on ecosystem function. And if that was the case, I wouldn't have any big problem with autumn olive. So that's question number one. Do novel ecosystems function as well as co-evolved ecosystems? Well, how can we, how can we measure function? Uh, it turns out it's not that not that hard. Uh, Robert MacArthur, a, a theoretical ecologist way back in the 50s, um, published this paper in, in 1955 uh, where he simply said, diversity begets stability and productivity. Uh, and he, you know, he called this the law of nature. He said, as you increase the number of species in an ecosystem, then ecosystem function goes up. And function could be measured in stability and productivity, however you want to measure it. And of course, as you move, as you remove species from ecosystems, then ecosystem function is going to go down. Now, this was a, a hypothesis. He he actually died very young uh, from cancer, but he so he was never able to actually test it. But uh, in the ensuing decades, many people have tested it, and they found that MacArthur was right. As you increase the number of species in an ecosystem, then ecosystem function improves, and as you take them away, uh, it it uh, diminishes. So that's good news because that means we can now measure ecosystem function simply by counting the number of species in that ecosystem. If an invaded ecosystem has more species, it ought to be in better shape. Uh, and if it has fewer shape species, it should not be in good shape. So that's the question. Do novel ecosystems contain as many species as co-evolved ecosystems? Well, you know, we've introduced more than 3,300 plant species to North America that are here now that weren't here uh, just a few years ago. If we have 3,300 more plant species in North America, shouldn't our ecosystems be functioning better now than they did before? Well, actually, it's a matter of scale. You have to look at where ecosystems function. They function locally. They don't function on a continental scale. So we need to measure ecosystem impacts locally. When you have a local invasion, are there more plant species than before that invasion? 
And the answer quite clearly is, is no. This is a porcelain berry invasion covering everything. When you get through, there's only two or three species here. This is porcelain berry at Cape May, New Jersey, major stopover point for migrating birds. This is a black cherry, a walnut, a sassafras. Um, they're all dead because they've been killed by porcelain berry. Um, you don't have more species after the invasion. Sagebrush communities that are invaded by cheatgrass. Um, so this is before, this is after. The cheatgrass has a very fast burn cycle and it kills all the sagebrush. So you end up with a monoculture of cheatgrass. Melaleuca in the Florida Everglades removes the species and becomes uh, a monoculture of Melaleuca. Kogon grass in the Southwest, Phragmites, um, spotted gnatweed, autumn olive. They're all doing the same thing. They push out the native plants and reduce the number of species in, in that invaded ecosystem. So invaded ecosystems typically, con typically contain far fewer species than invaded ecosystems. And here are all the studies, actually I ran out of room. There are a lot of studies documenting that that is actually the case. So the local loss of plant species is not something I think we should embrace. And I don't think we should name our, our streets after invasive species. And I don't think we should spell it wrong when we do name them. But let's, let's step back. Is the number of species in an ecosystem the appropriate metric for ecosystem function? Well, Alexander von Humboldt, von Humboldt um, one of the most unappreciated uh, biologists uh, ever, um, says, well, no, he said, nature really is, is a series of interconnected entities. It's not a collection of independent species. Uh, so he was saying that, that species interactions, ecological interactions are what we need to be thinking about. Uh, centuries later, Dan Jansen agrees, 1974, he says, what escapes the eye, however, is, is a much more insidious kind of extinction. It's the extinction of ecological interactions. So we're starting to think today that numbering, measuring the number of ecological interactions rather than the number of species is really what makes an ecosystem function. So let's modify our question a little bit and say, do introduced plants reduce the number of species interactions in an ecosystem? Well, now we need a good measure for interaction diversity. And there's a number of ways you can, you can measure it, but food webs is, is a great way to approach it because they are highly diverse. Food web complexity, um, particularly food webs involving plants, insects, and things that eat insects are a great way to measure interaction diversity. As a matter of fact, they've got the, some of the highest uh, diversities that, that are out there. Um, now, caterpillars are, are uh, really important insect herbivores because they are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So let's focus on caterpillars um, and ask, do introduced plants um, change caterpillar plant interactions? That's really the question we want to we wanna ask. Uh, we've been looking at this for a long time. This is a paper we got out in 2009. We looked at woody plants in the mid-Atlantic states, and that's how we define mid-Atlantic states. Uh, and we measured through the literature the number of host records of uh, native insects eating, well, both native and non-native insects, eating native plants versus non-native plants. Uh, and, and of course, most of them are eating native plants. The records on non-native plants are very few. There's a 90% reduction in the lepidopteran use of, of uh, woody non-native plants in the mid-Atlantic states. So right away, you see that uh, when you have an invasion, um, you're going to lose an awful lot of, of uh, interactions. Well, we also asked what happens to caterpillars when an introduced plant is closely related to a native plant. In other words, when it's a congener, it's in the same genus. We did a big common garden experiment uh, over, uh, well, I guess it was four years, uh, and we found even when the plants are closely related, there was a significant reduction in the use of, of uh, non-native plants. So here are the natives. These are the non-natives. You would predict that a, a native insect might be able to use a non-native plant if it's in the same genus, if that plant was close enough uh, in terms of plant chemistry to the natives that the insect is already adapted to. Uh, and it could use some of them, but there was a 65% reduction, both in generalists and in specialists. Uh, and that was in the abundance and also in the number of species that could use these plants, 58% reduction. Uh, so there is a loss, even though, even when the non-native plant is not closely related. What happens when the, the or when it is closely related? What happens when the, when the plant is not 
closely related, well, then you get an 80% reduction. It's even harder for native insects to, to use these plants, both generalists and, and specialists, in abundance and in species richness. Uh, we've measured it in the field. A common garden experiment is, is artificial. Uh, you know, we chose the plants, but in a typical invasion, uh, it's the real thugs that take over, like autumn olive, uh, multiflora rose, oriental bittersweet, all those guys. We went into hedgerows in Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Delaware, and we measured caterpillar abundance uh, in invaded hedgerows and in uninvaded hedgerows. And we found a 68% reduction in the number of species that could uh, were found in those invaded hedgerows, a 91% reduction in the abundance of those, uh, those um, caterpillars. And what about biomass? Biomass is the measure of energy flow through an ecosystem. And there was a 96% reduction in, in biomass. If you think of these caterpillars as bird food, you're really talking about a 96% reduction in the bird food available in a habitat invaded with, with uh, non-natives. Uh, so that's a big impact. Uh, it certainly impacts the birds that are looking for those caterpillars. They can't forage 96% harder to get the amount of food that they need. But remember, we're talking about interaction diversity. What happens to interaction diversity? An 84% reduction in inter interaction richness. Uh, so when you have a non-native invasion, there really is an impact on ecosystem function when you're measuring these metrics. But why are our insects unable to use plants from, from other continents? It's because most insects are specialists and they're specialists because most plants do not want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy for, them, for themselves and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they defend their tissues with nasty tasting chemicals. And it turns out that 90% of the insects that eat plants can only eat the plants for which they have adaptations that get around those chemical defenses that circumvent them. So they have specialized enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize the insect's exposure to those compounds. It takes a long period of evolutionary interactions with those plant lineages for all those adaptations to fall into place. And once they do, the insect is locked into eating that particular plant. Let's use the monarch butterfly as an example. Now we all know uh, the monarch is a, a specialist on milkweed. And you probably know that milkweed is a toxic plant. It's protected by cardiac glycosides. Those are the, the uh, nasty compounds in milkweeds. It's why we don't want to eat milkweeds, because if you eat enough milkweed, it will stop your heart. Well, it doesn't stop the monarch's heart, and they do have a heart, uh, because they've got the enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds. But milkweeds also, they're called milkweeds because they've got sticky latex sap in their veins, which is another form of defense. When you break open in a milkweed vein, uh, the, the uh, sap oozes out. And when it's exposed to air, it gels, um, becomes like chewing gum. And if you get this smeared on your mouth parts, if you're a caterpillar, it glues your mouth shut and then you starve to death. So it's a very effective defense. Well, we know that monarchs eat, eat milkweed. So how do they get around that sticky latex sap? You can watch this right in your yard, plant a milkweed, the monarch will, the caterpillar will crawl onto the leaf. First thing it does is go down to the end of the leaf and start eating. And if any latex sap at all starts to come out, it will stop eating, turn around and go back up the leaf, maybe two thirds of the way. And then it starts to chew through the midrib and it chews and it chews until it has completely severed the midrib. And what it's done is blocked the canals that shunt the uh, latex sap from this part of the leaf to this part of the leaf. And that, that makes all of this part of the leaf, um, it's fair game for the monarch now. Now it can eat it without getting any latex sap on its mandibles at all. So it turns around, goes back down to the end of the leaf and it can eat without the latex defense. Uh, that also flags the leaf, by the way, if you're looking for monarch butterflies, you can drive down the road and look at a milkweed patch. And if there's flag leaves, it means there have been caterpillars there because they're all trying to block the flow of that sticky latex sap. So those are the upsides of specialization. The monarch has the physiological capabilities of, of blocking milkweed defenses, and it's got the behavioral capabilities of blocking milkweed defenses. The downside of specialization is that now that's all that, that monarchs can eat. They are locked into eating milkweeds. And if we take milkweeds away from our landscapes, we lose the monarch. 
what's interesting is that, again, 90% of the insects that are out there have specialized relationships with their host plants, just like the monarch. Monarchs are not exceptions. So this is one of the problems of bringing in plants from other continents. Um, they end the specialized relationships between our native insects and the plants. But we do have 10% of those insects that are generalists. Um, can they use introduced plants? And maybe they compensate for the loss of all of those specialists. Okay, we looked at that. We started with the Luna moth, which has um, 25 host records in the literature. And what we did was rear it from egg uh, until uh, pupa on all of the non-native plants. These were all the non-native plants right in, in this area. Most of them were on my property. Uh, and we found that sweet gum, which is his native host in this area, it was the only thing it survived on to, to reach pupation. It died on all the rest of them. So it's a generalist if you just count the number of things that, that it, uh, the literature says it can eat, but it couldn't eat any of the uh, non-native plants. We did the same thing with bagworm, which is recorded, I think, on 84 uh, genera of, of plants. It's much more of a generalist than a, a uh, luna moth is. Uh, and it survived a little bit better, not enough. The the uh, native host where we work is is black cherry. It did well on black cherry, but uh, died on most of them and eventually never made it to pupation on, on the others. So even a, a real generalist like bagworm is unable to handle these non-native plants. Then finally, uh, white marked tussock moth, which is recorded, I think, on 110 genera of plants. Again, did a little bit better, but same same pattern. The only time it, it reached uh, maturity, reached pupation, was on native black cherry. So even extreme generalists are unable to use these non-native plants. They are not going to compensate for the loss of specialists. But this study also uh, led us to ask, what is a generalist? Now, again, the, the luna moth recorded on 25 uh, plant genera. You'd think that would be a generalist. What we did was rear it on all of the host plants that it's recorded on in the literature. Uh, and uh, this was a population that we, we collected from sweet gum and it did well on sweet gum. It survived and made little teeny micro uh, luna moths on walnut, uh, but didn't make it on any of the other, uh, these are native plants that it's recorded on in other parts of the country. So what this illustrates is that you've got local specialization even within species that we think of as, as uh, generalists. Uh, so the, the individuals we got, the eggs we got were from moths uh, that specialize on, on sweet gum. And when you try to rear them on other native plants, uh, they can't make it. So that, you know, uh, luna moths are recorded on oaks but that's probably in the Ozarks. Uh, they can't make it on the oaks here. So local specialization turns generalists into specialists, just as if they were specialists. So that's the, the bottom line. Introduced plants destroy food web interactions that is not going to help ecosystem function. And these are uh, many, not all of the, the, the um, studies that we have completed that are published if you want to read more about it. Now we're not fooling the birds when we create novel ecosystems and bring in plants from someplace else. I had a student that looked at uh, how well chickadees do in suburban uh, landscapes within the beltway of, of Washington, DC. Uh, and this is a typical uh, um, foraging range of a pair of chickadees. Right there is where the nest was. And this represented 90% of the foraging that that pair of chickadees did. The blue areas represent where all of that foraging occurred. Those are the plants on which they were foraging for their young. So let's see what they, they are. It was basswood, it was sweet gum, it was American elm, black cherry, and then two species of oaks. All of these plants were native plants. But let's also look at the non-native plants that were available to these chickadees, but they didn't use them. Japanese maples and silk trees and ginkgos and black poplar, crepe myrtles, Leyland cypress, saucer magnolia. And of course, these are the trees that are so common in our suburban neighborhoods because we plant them for ornamental reasons, not for ecological function. So when we load our landscapes with non-native plants, the birds cannot use them. Now, how do they know that they shouldn't forage in, in ginkgos? Well, they don't know. They go there once. 
the cupboard is bare. They don't find any caterpillars, so they don't waste time searching there over and over again. Uh, so it's it's just like going to the supermarket. If you if you went to shop right and there was nothing in the store, you wouldn't return. And that's exactly what the chickadees do. There are also 51 species of birds that um, migrate and and were recorded in the study plots that my my student did. Uh, and they, of course, during their migration, they stop to eat as well. Uh, and if your landscape is, is landscape with ginkgos, for example, which nothing eats, uh, then there's nothing for those migrants to, to forage on. Um, so even though you may not have a property that is big enough to uh, house a breeding bird uh, territory, uh, it, if it can hold one tree, it's big enough to help migrating birds that will stop on that tree as they forage as long as there is food available. Okay, do birds care whether a berry is native or not? That's another good question. Well, the interaction between birds and berries is another co-evolved interaction, just like between insects and plants. Um, plants want their seeds to be dispersed, and they're using birds as a dispersal mechanism. So they surround the seed with a tasty berry, and they produce that berry uh, at the time of year they want their seed to be dispersed. So if you want your seed to be dispersed in the summertime, you make a, a berry that is high in sugar because birds have just finished reproducing and uh, they're eating a lot of insects that are high in fat and high in protein. Now they're looking for carbohydrates. So things like blueberries are, are perfect for uh, uh, birds, um, elderberries, these things that are high, high in sugar. Of course, they eat the berry, then they fly away and they poop out the seeds and that's how the dispersal happens. If you want your seed to be dispersed in the fall, you want to produce a berry that is very high in fat. These are poison ivy berries, uh, and a number of birds eat them because they're very high in, in fat. Remember, migrating birds need sources of fat to fuel that migration, and overwintering birds need sources of fat to fuel that migration. If they don't have the sources of fat, they're in trouble. Then finally, there are berries that um, become edible late in the winter. Uh, throughout the winter, like winter berry is a good one, the holly berries. Um, they're very difficult to eat. They're, they're not tasty at all through much of the winter, but late in the winter after they've thawed and frozen a number of times, they become high in sugar. Uh, and that's what the birds are looking for at that point too, because they're getting ready to go into their, their breeding season uh, when they'll eat a lot of fat and protein and they want carbohydrates before that. So the, the phenology of berry production does predict when birds are going to take those seeds. Well, a woman named... Um, uh, her last name is Smith, and she got married. I'm having a senior moment. Can't remember her first name. Uh, anyway, she did some wonderful work looking at uh, the fat content of native berries versus non-native berries, and she found a very striking pattern. Native berries, starting with with uh, you know wax myrtle and and uh, native viburnums and spice bush and dogwoods and Virginia creeper, all very high in fat. This is exactly what the birds want in the fall when they're migrating. Uh, but the non-native berries that are available at the same time, extremely low in fat, less than 1% for multiflora rose, the honeysuckles, less than 1%, buckthorn, 0.5%, autumn olive, 2%, uh, oriental bittersweet, 2.6%. So this is a fraction of what those birds need. So the non-native berries are not supplying the fat content that the native berries do. Uh, and uh, when this study was published, she had not looked at preference, but it turns out that birds actually do prefer the berries that are high in fat when there is a choice. But typically when you have a, a an invasion, the native plants are gone, so there is no choice. And they will eat these berries, but it's not supplying what they need. So most, maybe all, introduced berry producers are phenologically out of sync with the needs of the berries. They are producing high sugar berries in the fall rather than the summer. So the answer to that question is birds do care about whether a, bird, a berry is native or non-native. How about this? If an alien plant supports a particular butterfly, bee, or beetle, is it contributing to ecosystem function? Um, because there are papers that, that claim it is. But this reasoning considers what is gained from this plant without considering what is lost through its presence. Uh, so kudzu, for example, we all know about kudzu, you know, terrible scourge. It's taking over the, the Smokies. Introduced from, from Asia, 
Um, now, the silver spotted skipper uh, can eat kudzu. As a matter of fact, I took this picture on a kudzu leaf. This is what the larva looks like. It has moved over. It has expanded its, its uh, range and consumes kudzu. So now you say, okay, kudzu is a good host for silver spotted skipper. But when a kudzu invades an area, what is lost? Well, you lose your violets, uh, which means you lose your, all your fritillaries. You lose your milkweed, which means you lose all the things that specialize on milkweed, including milk, uh, monarchs and the big milkweed bug and the milkweed tussock moth, milkweed beetle, all those, those milkweed specialists will be lost. Spicebush supports 11 species. When it's covered with kudzu, it's, it's going to be lost. Greenbrier supports 19 species of caterpillars. Virginia creeper supports 32. Sweet gum supports 35. Hackberry supports 43. Viburnum supports 104. Goldenrod, 110. Black nut, walnut, 129 species. Elms, 215 species. Maples, 297 species. Oaks of the winter, 557 species uh, of caterpillars. These are all in the, the mid-Atlantic states. So when you get kudzu covering these plants and killing them, you have lost a lot of, of species. You've also lost the birds that require all those caterpillars because they're not going to get them on kudzu. So you gain the silver spotted skipper, but you lose thousands of other species. The net change is highly negative here, and it's obvious whether or not we want these invasive species. Returning ecosystems to some mythical pristine state is a fool's errand. Well, that's not the goal. Uh, it is true. It's going to be impossible to, to turn the clock back. But the goal is to create ecosystem function uh, by reuniting enough of the specialized interactions I opened the talk with to create a functional ecosystem, making ecosystem services, even if it's not exactly what was on a particular space at some point in the past. Uh, so returning into a mythical pristine state is not the, the goal. Shouldn't there be a statute of limitations on being non-native? That is a good question. Uh, well, when does an introduced plant become a native? It becomes a native when it acts like a native. How do we know uh, when it's acting like a native? We go to where it is native and look at what's happening there. So here are several introduced plants, uh, common reed, phragmites, and eucalyptus, and uh, opuntia, um, uh, one of the clematis invasives, Melaleuca in Florida. Um, these are the number of years they've been here. Phragmites has been here 300 plus years. It was used as, as uh, ballast uh, in the earliest ships. And when they reached shore, they just threw them onto the land and that's how it got here. Well, the genotype that's us, that is, is uh, invasive is from Europe. It supports 170 species in Europe. After being here 300 years, it supports only five species. And those five species jumped onto it right away. There was no adaptation involved. They already had the adaptations that they needed to use Phragmites, but nothing else has, has jumped on since. Um, Eucalyptus in California supports 48 species in, in its homeland. Australia only supports one species in California. It's been here 100 years. Uh, cactus, 16 species. I don't even know where it came from. I guess India. No species have jumped on here. It's been here 250 years. Melaleuca, 409 species in Australia, where it's actually a rare plant. Um, it's been here 120 years, and eight species are now using it in, in uh, Florida. So, you know, uh, adaptation happens. It's very, very slow, though, uh, and these species are not even close to acting like a native. They have not reached their, their potential, and certainly they're not acting like the native species they have pushed out. We don't like introduced plants because of nativism. That's ridiculous. If you look at what is, is uh, sold in our nurseries, more than 80% of the plants sold in our nurseries are non-native plants. People love them. So it's not that we don't like non-native plants. We think they're the prettiest ones and, and uh, that makes no sense. Our response to introduced plants is based on as much on aesthetics and morality and politics as it is on science. Well, the person that made this statement uh, was not a scientist, actually a social scientist, and he doesn't seem to know the science because there's a lot of it telling us uh, that these plants are not such a good idea. So let's revisit uh, the plant invasions are not bad statement. No global extinctions recorded from mainland invasions. Um, not yet, not yet. 
Uh, but um, there are plenty on, on islands, uh, for one thing, and uh, mainlands are just big islands. That hasn't happened yet. What's going to happen is American bittersweet and red mulberry uh, will very soon be lost through introgression. Uh, so we brought in um, uh, oriental bittersweet and white mulberry. Those are the invasives, and they cross with our natives, and the resulting offspring are essentially non-native. So it's, uh, the American bittersweet has been lost from the mid-Atlantic stage. You can find it in northern Maine at this point, but it's almost gone. Same thing with red, red mulberry. You have to go to Texas to find a real red mulberry these days. So uh, global extinctions will occur. Post-invasion species richness is higher. No, it's not. Not locally where ecosystems function. It is much, much lower. Do birds care whether a berry is native or not? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Invaded communities are different, but not inappropriate. I don't know what that means. Uh, introduced plants are here to stay, so we should embrace them. Well, cancer is here to stay too, but I don't. That doesn't mean we should embrace it. So um, I'm going to reject that as well. So are introduced plants bad? Uh, well, if we consider ecosystem function very carefully, which I've tried to do in this talk, we can say with confidence that introduced plants are bad. They are bad at supporting the insects that are the bread and butter of local food webs. They are bad at supporting insectivores. If you take away the insects, you've lost the things that eat those insects. They're bad at supporting specialist pollinators. We didn't even talk about that. But when you lose the plants, these pollinators uh, require you lose those pollinators. They're bad at supporting complex food webs. They're bad at supporting stable food webs. They're bad at supporting local diversity, interaction diversity, and ecosystem function. And that's all I have. Time for questions. Okay, can you maybe I'm so we can hear you? And then if you want to make me host or if you want then I or we just have to make sure to help the people that are online. And we do have some people in the audience that can, can hear us. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to say time for questions, and we have to monitor TV screens and human bodies. So 